but it's nice to see everyone and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry, I'm Andrew Leong. I'm an associate professor in the philosophy department at UMass Boston. I teach legal studies, Asian American studies, as well as Latino studies. I've been doing anti-gentrification work and uh, activism work within the Asian American community for about 30 years. Uh, and at the end of 2013, along with my co um, um, Writers published a gentrification uh, study of Boston, Chinatown, New York, Chinatown, and uh, Philly, Chinatown. And I serve as advisor to the documentary. Thank you, Andrew. And Eddie? Hi, everyone. My name is Eddie Moy. I was born and raised in Washington, DC. I manage a property family business in DC for the last 40 years or so. And uh, my parents immigrated from uh, China, and he, my dad served in World War II. I'm currently a real estate broker and agent and appraiser. And uh, I'm a president of the Moy Association that's located in DC, Chinatown. Thank you. And finally, Ted. Hello, my name is Ted Gong. I'm the executive director of the 1882 Foundation, and we are a nonprofit educational uh, organization that promotes awareness and the continuing of the history and continuing significance of the 1882 Exclusion Act. We do this through programs that related to oral history and historical preservation of sites, uh, curriculum and lesson plan development, and uh, working with uh, museums and APA historical societies to promote best practices and uh, collaboration. Thank you. So we have a really exciting lineup of panelists joining us for this conversation today. I'm, I'm going to quickly jump in and I'm going to start with Lisa. Um, Lisa, I know Penny Lee, your co-producer, um, cannot join us today, unfortunately. Um, and um, to give some context for our audience, can you share a little bit about the two of you met and how you came up with the idea of producing this film? Sure. So, um, so Penny and I met about five, six years ago. Um, I was working in television. I have a career in television, uh, developing shows for uh, networks like Discovery Channel, National Geographic, HGTV, and the like. Um, and I was working in that career when I met Penny through my father. So my father was um, overseeing a, a like a a nonprofit called the Sino-American Cultural Society, which their mission is to promote events, uh, to promote Chinese culture around the DC area. And Penny had reached out to my dad for funding for a video project that she was doing with Ted. And so my dad, you know, being always wondering, where's the money going? He was like, oh, where's the money going? You should talk to my daughter, who's a TV producer. Um, and so that's how I met Penny. And after speaking to Penny about this video project that she was doing with Ted, which was a like a talk story project where they were trying to capture the experiences of those who had lived in Chinatown in DC's Chinatown. Um, you know, I thought, okay, well, it sounds like this is a documentary, and so we kind of went from there. You know, Ted at the 1882 Foundation, he had a grant. He wanted to put together, really, Ted's dream was to put together a, a like a half hour series about DC's Chinatown. Um, and so so we ended up working on a short film called um, Through Chinatown's Eyes, April 1968, which really stringing together the experiences of those who lived in DC's Chinatown in the 60s, surrounding the event of you know the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the uh, the ensuing uh, you know riots that occurred. So that was the first project that Penny and I worked on. It was kind of a, a beautiful project for us to work on together because I have a background in history. Um, I went to graduate school for a master's in history and I majored in history in college and um, you know, Penny is an editor. I write and de and develop and produce shows. So it just was a nice, you know, joining of our skill sets. So we did that film a couple of like about five years ago, and then after that film, 
people kept asking us, you know, what's next? What, what's next? Like, what is the next film? And so we thought, okay, well, gentrification seems to be the next natural story. Um, and so we we went from there. Um, so this film has been about three years in the making uh, because both of us have careers and you know, full-time jobs. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and so that's, that's how it goes. Why, why DC, uh, Boston and, and Chicago, you ask? Um, we, DC, we always knew was going to be one of the stories because it is, I don't want to say it's a dead, it's kind of a dead Chinatown. I mean, yes, it's a Chinatown, but it's a shell of what it was in terms of a, a community um, that's living there. So, you know, we definitely wanted to explore that. And then I felt, well, if we're going to look at that, we should look at other Chinatowns around the country. So um, ever, you know, someone who's always thinking about titles, three is a good number, you know, let's see how we can compare and contrast three. So we looked at Boston, which is there's a lot of activism going on in Boston. Um, so we thought that could be a very interesting story. They're facing a lot of forces, um, you know, from, you know, residential development, uh, institutional development, um, you know, things of that nature, state development. Um, so that seemed to, to be a, a, a good a good story of, of activism happening now. And then through our research and speaking to Andrew, he told us about Chicago, that Chicago is growing. And so we thought, okay, let's go with one that's like pretty much on the way out, one that's like fighting for its survival and then one that is thriving and growing. And let's explore how all three of those really came to be. Well, thank you so much for the overview. And in fact, when I was talking to our festival director and she suggested, you know, why don't you moderate this conversation? And I said, well, I'm not an expert on films and I'm hardly an expert on Chinatowns. So are you sure I'm a good fit? But um, this is incredibly interesting to me. I've done a ton of work around um, anti-gentrification as well when I was working at a nonprofit called National Capacity. So it is a topic that I'm deeply invested and interested in. Um, and speaking of Boston Chinatown, um, Andrew, I want to move to you next. Um, there are several segments that are featuring you during the film. Um, can you share a little bit about the work that you've done in Boston Chinatown and how that has informed um, your work on the documentary? Sure. Um, you know, when, when I first came to Boston for law school in the early 80s, um, one of the things that we did not learn in law school, but within the community, is that there were already heavy forces at play in taking over Chinatown, Spe specifically in Boston Chinatown. Uh, there were institutional expansion by Tufts University and New England Medical Center. And soon thereafter, we, we started to see in the late 90s as well as the 2000s, a lot of the, the much more you know, mega type of gentrification where block by block, you know, whereas in the past historically is, you know, usually maybe, you know, one building and then another building, but we're talking about huge parcels of land. And so those are the kind of battles that we were fighting with in, within Boston Chinatown to make sure that environmental review processes would, were adhered to and that you know, we, would, we would make sure that we would be able to emphasize the voice of the residents that live here, the small businesses that conduct their livelihood within Chinatown. And so in many ways, you know, my, my activism, my work and my research in Boston Chinatown grew uh, as I started to, to talk to other activists, you know, within New York Chinatown, as well as in Philly Chinatown. During one of my sabbaticals, I actually studied uh, Philadelphia uh, Chinatown and saw very similar traits and patterns of expansion, you know, just like with the MCI Convention Center with, within DC and all the various different promises that were given to Chinatown. And so these are the kind of things I've worked on in the past that uh, allowed me to become uh, uh, a position, you know, of playing the advisory role within the documentary. Well, I feel like um, gentrification itself could be a topic of its own, and we could we could even do a whole hour program just on that topic itself. And um, it sounds like there's a lot of work um, to be done, and, and you've done a ton of research in this area as well. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your perspectives. Um, 
quickly, I wanted to move over to Eddie next. Um, Eddie, you you spoke um, at the beginning of the film about um, the Moy Family Association. Um, for the audience who may not have watched the film yet, um, I will be curious to learn more about the Moy Family Association. Can you share with us what is a family association and why was it formed? And then um, and the second part of my question is, you, you said you grew up in DC Chinatown, so I know the Chinatown then looks very different than the Chinatown now. So what was it like growing up in the DC Chinatown then, and you know, where was your favorite place to hang out? Okay, yeah, basically, um, yeah, being you know, born and raised in DC, my, my dad was, actually came here when we, he was young, and uh, my grandfather had a store at a restaurant and uh, actually, he had a laundromat in Alexandria. And then my dad, uh, he he came over here when he was like 12 years old, he was a teenager. And then he um, served in World War II, went to high school in uh, in uh, Virginia. And then by the time he finished the uh, his service there, he, he got a Purple Heart. My grandfather then had a restaurant right across the street from the Ben's Chili Bowl in the Lincoln Theater. And uh, that was, uh, he had a Utah grill restaurant and uh, he was served in the community and he got moved out from eminent domain from uh, Metro. So right across the street from uh, the Ben's Chili Bowl and the Lincoln Theater is the uh, Metro right now. And shortly after that, my, my dad got married to my mom and um, he started raising a family right in downtown on 6th Street. And, where the um, Chinatown Express restaurant is now. That's where the building where we grew up. And my dad, you know, decided to open a grocery store called Veterans Market. And uh, he was doing pretty good, you know. It was five of us. And uh, and um, my my dad got eventually got pushed out by Metro again. <laughs> my grandfather, now my grand my father. So Metro took it over eminent domain. So he moved from G Street and Six and G, and now, and he decided to buy a property in uh, on between Fifth and Sixth Street on H. So meanwhile, my dad bought quite a few properties on H Street, and he had a grocery store. And then uh, he passed away in 1980. And meanwhile, I was living in uh, California. And and I came back to help my mom out, you know, and ever since 1980, I've been here back here and helping my mom, you know, manage the properties and uh, and take care of the other, other business. Meanwhile, while my dad was uh, back here, uh, he was, um, him and a lot of associations back then, growing up in DC, the Asians were not really uh, acceptable to get loans you know, from uh, public banks and so on. So they have formed associations where each association, whether it's Chin, Lead, Benevolence or whatever, they would form banks of their own where the families would contribute or donate or to make deposits every weekly on Sundays. And then every, the rotation would start where, you know, where some of the members would get money, borrow money, they, they all started buying buildings, you know, for the Chin and Lee's. So how the Moy Family Association started, my dad and three other uh, community leaders, you know, there were Moy's, and my uncle was uh, Hamilton Moy. He was an attorney. He decided to buy a building right on I Street. So they formed it, and they just bought the building together. And throughout the years, you know, the uh, the more all the individual who contributed money to buy the more association, you know, got reimbursed and paid back. So and we just help donate and, and volunteer and, and, and uh, keep up the building and uh, just rent it out, make some money. So it's self-contained throughout the, all these years. So that that formed a more association. And then the more association from New York, you know, we, was interested, you know, that's how, how we thrive. Boston had an association, and Chicago, they have a big, big community for the Moy Association. 
Thank you. And Andrew, I see you nodding along as um, Ted was speaking. Is there anything you would like to chime in on? No, it's just that, you know, what, what Eddie was talking about is uh, a part and parcel of the kind of, you know, unheard history that, right. that we have <laughs> associated with the Asian American, you know, uh, uh, um, history, which is, for instance, you know, uh, redlining. N you know, very few people understood that, you know, redlining occurred within the you know, Ch Chinese American, Japanese American, Asian American community. I'm, I'm trying to finish up an article right now about the same, right? Um, but it's because of how, you know, the introduction of the model minority myth in the, in the late 50s and early 60s that began to transform our identity that allowed us to then get bank loans and move into suburbia. Whereas previous to that, you know, we were just as much, you know, blocked out of uh, banks, loans, you know, or, or even movement into any, anything else. And then the other thing that you know Eddie talked about with respect to the eminent domain, it happened to many of us. You know, my family operated a small Chinese restaurant in Des Moines, Iowa, of all places. And why, you know, why did we stop? Because of eminent domain, right? So this is again part and parcel of the the impact that governments, you know, cities, states, federal government have on minority communities. Yeah, and, and I think we'll go more into um, the perspective of gentrification soon um, in the next segment of our questions. Um, and thanks so much for contributing to that comment, um, Andrew, and I'll come back to you in a moment. Ted, um, I know the, the 1882 Foundation's uh, headquarters currently located in the basement of the Moy Family Association. So I'm um, kind of curious to you know learn more about how that arrangement happened. And if you, if you could also just briefly share about the 1882 Foundation, what it does and, and why it's founded, will help us set the context for this conversation. Yeah, thanks. You know, about uh, 10 years ago, a number of us thought that uh, somebody ought to apologize for the 1882 Exclusion Act, which was never, it was rescinded, but there was never any expression of regret or remorse or, or acknowledgement of the of what those laws actually caused to the Chinese uh, then and even up to today. So we, we started a program about 11 years ago and got Congress to uh, pass unanimously, both in the House and the Senate, um, expressions of regret for the 1882 Act. Afterwards, we decided to form an education foundation uh, to continue promoting public awareness of the act, its continuing consequence, and also to talk about the uh, 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 how, how we should preserve our stories. And of course, being in Washington, we have a focus in Washington. Although because of the way we did it, there was a national campaign to get the, exclude, the Congress to apologize for the Exclusion Act. And that give, gives us a bit of a national scope. But uh, we're all a bunch of volunteers. We don't do anything other than than uh, than to try to promote awareness in the programs that we talked about. Evelyn and Eddie and these people were very supportive, uh, and the, they had a vacancy in their uh, building, and we decided to take it up, and that's where we are. By the way, we're looking for expansion. And so that's going to affect a lot of things, especially how we talk about Chinatown. So go back into some of the ideas of Chinatown. I think that Eddie and Andrew and within the film, which, by the way, Lisa really is superbly done, well, uh, well put together, uh, talks about redlining, but also the idea of how public works, especially in the 50s, have so affected not only places like Chinatown, but also as we begin to know all the various ethnic uh, communities, everything from Tulsa to even Richmond, the highway program just sort of like destroyed a lot of our communities. And we should be aware of how that how, how that impact, uh, how that occurred. And certainly that's the case here in Washington in some ways. But also we talk about other issues in development in Chinatown. It's not just an easy gentrification where people, uh, we need to define what that is. We need to define what actually is a Chinatown. And I think you covered a lot of that in your movie. So I would recommend film. And so I recommend all of you guys to take a look at it. The one thing that is interesting to me is that I don't think you can look at each of the three Chinatowns or other Chinatowns, uh, three Chinatowns, Boston, uh, 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 Chicago, or DC as one being the next development or the next stage in the changing of Chinatown. I'm not sure if gentrification covers everything that we need to talk about. I think Andrew's discussion of Disney 
diversification is actually a very important thing to watch out for. But I think also that if you're looking at uh, how do you preserve Chinatown beyond the, the Disneyfication uh, element that you talk about, Andrew, and it would be great if we could talk even more about it because it's a little bit different from the, our thoughts of what economic gentrification is. It's, a, it's a, an effort actually to try to maintain the Chinatown, to preserve the culture of Chinatown. We, the Chinese community, are as responsible for uh, anything other than, say, commercial guys who are trying to Disney-fy the place or to make it a tourist uh, tourist attraction. So if we look beyond the Disneyfication, what are we looking at? In D.C. Chinatown, one of the things we're doing in the 1882 project is to try to make sure that uh, we have centered our Chinatown into issues of preserving uh, culture or make it as, I think Lisa has used this a couple of times in her films, it's a cultural, cultural touch point or a place that we can go, go back to renew our identities. And the way you do that is not necessarily that you maintain residence there, but also maintain, in the film, you talk about maintaining social services, but it also services about talking about how you preserve the history, how do you maintain the history, how do you do the research? So if I can get a place developed, and Eddie, this is where I was talking to you before about building the, uh, building the storytelling center here in the Moy Center and next to the CCBA, then that will go a long ways into sort of preserving our culture and at least having a place where our identity can be renewed. Ted, you touched on a lot of things that, that I would like to cover next. Um, you talked about cultural preservation. You talked about Disneyfication. Um, you talked about a lot of the different Chinatowns, um, seeing very similar things happening across the country. Um, kind of curious, Lisa and Andrew, do you have any comments on those points? Oh, absolutely. I, I just got back from uh, a, a working vacation. Uh, from San Francisco, where we met with a bunch of you know uh, younger activists within San Francisco Chinatown right now because they're facing enormous issues with anti-Asian violence, right? So they they like most other uh, Chinatowns are engaging in some protectionism, you know, in trying to have night guarding, you know, uh, folks go, going out just to make sure and help some of the elderly, right? So those are the 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 various different stages of the. Uh, kind of uh, social issues that we uh, that that each different Chinatown is confronted with. You know, the same trip, we also went down to and uh, met with historical preservation folks from Salinas Chinatown, and Salinas Chinatown was was actually the third you know largest Chinatown in California, right? You know, uh, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and then Salinas in the middle. Right, but at this point in time, Salinas is like you know being erased off the map. And so when we when we met with people, you know, they said, you know, we want to make sure we want to buy these particular buildings, we want to preserve, we want to make sure our history is not erased. And so a shout out, you know, to those folks and encouragement to those folks, right? Because this is not just it's not just about Salinas Chinatown, but it's about many of those non-urban Chinatowns that are mm -hmm. disappearing and have been disappearing and wiped out. And when you go visit you know, Monterey or other places, there may be a little plaque or Denver, a little plaque left that marks you know, the existence of the Chinese um, before government intrusion displaced us, you know, be, displaced our small businesses, displaced our residents. So these are all the just the beginning, the, the tip of the iceberg that we were able to touch upon within the documentary. Yeah. yeah. And then I would say, like to Ted's point, you know, it, right, there none of these Chinatowns are the same, right? They all face different forces. They, even though primarily um, the populations that came to all these Chinatowns primarily came from the same general area of China, um, like Toysan and Southern China, you know, different family branches have different personalities, right? I mean, even within a, a, a small family. So, you know, when you're talking about a people, of course, you know, each group of immigrants that settles in one particular place, of course, it will develop and evolve very differently. Um, so yeah, the, we're not saying that, you know, oh, Chinatown, ubiquitous, it's all the same, not at all. I mean, I'd say that, you know, we are trying to explore how is it that one developed a certain way and then another developed in a certain other way. I mean, I know that when we were talking about um, 
you know, DC and, you know, Eddie, so Eddie was in the first film um, as well, the, you know, um, uh, through Chinatown's eyes, you know, we, you know, we, we did note that, you know, DC, the fact that it's the District of Columbia, which is run basically funded by the federal government, Okay, most people don't really realize that, but you know, there's a whole DC statehood movement. But you know, again, at the time, you know, like the federal government was a big force in terms of moving the original Chinatown. This is covered in the film very briefly. The original DC Chinatown was actually on Pennsylvania Avenue, but it got moved because the federal government wanted to put in the federal triangle, you know, and so it got moved. And so, you know, DC's story is very is very different because you're literally dealing with the federal government whereas in chicago yes you were dealing with big business and you were dealing with you know maybe city government um but it, again it's there it's not completely the same and but you know i would say through the film we wanted to explore how are these places similar how are these places very different and how do those differences how did those differences really shape where these 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 um neighborhoods are today I think, I think the way that you have put together the film and ordered it in certain ways and the transitions, I think are re done really well. It's not meant to be, uh, I, don't, I don't take it to mean that there's only one linear progression from one to the other, but you're able to raise those issues very nicely, actually, almost chronologically, but also as development stages. And so I would really recommend it for a lot of people to talk to see these films. But Andrew touches on some things that are really important to me is rural Chinatowns. And it's interesting to talk about Salinas and so forth because I have a lot of interest in Salinas or Hanford or Fresno, <laughs> these kind of places. Fresno used to be one of the biggest Chinatowns in the California. But Salinas, but that raises some other issues. Some of the, the problems with say preserving, say a Chinatown concept, not necessarily a resonance, but a place like that. So, so one thing, I think that Stan had mentioned and something we talk about that the Chinatown is actually a state of mind or a concept that we have to figure out. And we have to figure out how to reinforce that, not necessarily the resonance, but also uh, how, do, how does that work? But Salinas raises some other things, which actually DC is facing now and maybe some of these other places. Uh, for example, homelessness or the problem with uh, the Salinas Chinatown, it abuts right there where Kent City has been there for dozen years <laughs> yeah no so in fact that's the major yeah. issue that you know, that we face in salinas right now right yeah. that on on both sides of the street going down absolutely uh, um soledad it's tense 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 mm -hmm. and all the buildings are you know practically vacant right there may be one or two various different missions and various different newer housing that's being developed there but you know the 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 Asian American, the Chinese American landowners there are trying to figure out what do we do aside yeah. from just sitting there land banking. Yeah. Right? yeah. So Salinas and other other rural Chinatown face totally different issues than rural uh, than urban Chinatowns like Toronto Chinatown or much more so Montreal Chinatown where yeah. where there's hyper gentrification. And the problem in Mon Montreal, you know, it's not just about you know United States, but it's really happening you know throughout. You know, many, many very different cities, and in Montreal, you know, we will, we could potentially lose much of what is Montreal Chinatown within the span of the next five to ten years oh, if the yeah. city government is not going to do anything about really legitimizing, you know, some sort of a historical preservation. And so it gets back to all this concept about, you know, how do we go about defining right. Chinatown? Right. You know, right. Does it have to and have a residential component yeah. or, or small businesses, right? But it's yeah. all different. Like Andrew, when, when Andrew and I were, were, when I was researching the film and consulting with Andrew about where to take the film, you know, we did talk about the fact that what we're talking about in the film is historical Chinatowns. I mean, these are Chinatowns that people have known for about the last hundred years of what a Chinatown is. And we also talked about the fact that Chinatown is morphing as we look at suburban enclaves, like in Flushing, like in San Gabriel Valley, like in um, uh, outside of San Jose. You know, we, we've talked about that. And of course, we didn't want to touch on it because that's a whole other film in itself. But, you know, it raises this question of, and this came up a few times as well, you know, 
what it, who is who is Chinatown for? Andrew poses that question in the film, and you know, I it's not an easy question to answer. You know, on the one hand, um, you know, I had asked Andrew this in the film. You know, like what would you like to see? You know, it's like okay, all this stuff, all this stuff, but what would you like to see? I think Ted years ago, years ago, I think I had posed maybe the same question to you too, just offline in a conversation, like knowing what's happening or what's happened to DC's Chinatown, that essentially it's mostly facade, right? I mean, it's like there's a city ordinance where, you know, urban outfitters, Bed Bath and Beyond, they can move in, but you gotta have the Chinese characters. But really, like what what's that about? I mean, it's it's facade. Um, you know, it's it's clear that that the community of of what Eddie knew growing up is not there anymore. Um, but what do we do then? You know, and I think Ted at the time, you had said that your your hope was like a museum or something to like commemorate this place. So I, I think it's a it's a bigger question. There's no answer. Um, but you know, again, it, it's it's a it's a bigger conversation to to have. And that you've all made some really, really good points. And I'd love to um, double click on that in just a moment. We're actually also getting a ton of audience engagement and questions coming through. Um, <clears throat> and Andrew, to follow up on a point that you said earlier, um, Neil has a question for you. Can an arts and media center in Chinatown sponsored by the local government funds like an SF happen in DC? It, it, it can, uh, but I mean, the, the problem is that, you know, when, you, when we're talking about governmental actions, right, what we really want is to have them utilize, flex their muscles and not just give us, you know, a few thousand here and there, right, but make sure that they look at governmental actions in a much more holistic manner. How do we go about preserving and promoting small businesses? How do we go about, you know, preserving and promoting, you know, a public housing, right, to make sure that the immigrant class uh, and next generation of immigrants, you know, continue to provide some sense of life, you know, within uh, Chinatown. And so all of these questions are much more holistic in manner. It's not simply about, you know, as long as we can pass some sort of a bilingual signage uh, uh, ordinance, you know, we, we will then you know, preserve, uh, you know, the historical portion of Chinatown. But the, the more important thing that I want to make sure people understand uh, that came out of the documentary is really this particular concept about what Chinatown has, all, has really always stood for, which is a sanctuary and that sense of belonging, not just for Chinese, but for Asian Americans. And in fact, Salinas is what we, what we saw as an example, right? The folks that are there, it was, it was initially a Chinatown for Chinese, but then the Japanese came in. Then the Filipinos came in. Then Chicanos came in. Then African Americans came in. And now, you know, it's the unhoused population, right? But all those activists that are that are trying to preserve Salinas Chinatown are, in fact, you know, the, the Filipinos, the Japanese Americans, all these other people that have no, you know, no real connection to being Chinese per se, right? So this again tells us that you know as in in the united states we find belonging in these spaces whether we call it chinatown whether we call it little saigon j town koreatown you know we feel comfort belonging in those particular circles yeah you know i really like the idea andrew had uh, you were you were raising uh, throughout the film that uh, if you look historically chinatown's the place for sanctuary sanctuary from being killed <laughs> during the the uh exclusion period sanctuary for food sanctuary for as an interpol for getting skills to get on the interland and sanctuary for identity uh and feeling comfortable those are all good themes but i did want to go back a little bit i also I wanted to reinforce your idea too. You have to look at things holistically. So mm -hmm. to these questions and to Anne, these questions about how do you, what do you do in terms of preserving Chinatowns and so forth. The sign, the sign ordinances are important. They do mark your space. And so those things that are, are facade true, but there are a lot of other things that are going behind the buildings and what they're uh, on the second floors. I think the second floors, as Eddie knows and so forth, the CCBAs, the 30 associations are still very active. The uh, China, the Cantonese Opera Club is still as strong as ever in the last 60 years <laughs> that they've been here. But the other part of this is the Neil's question is, can we find a place 
that we can develop into a story center. And he cites San Francisco. But I agree with Andrew in some ways. We can do that. And I don't think you should do rely simply on a government uh, react, uh, thing. It has to be something that is public, private, the uh, landowners and other people have to do it. And you have to do it holistically. And if you look at Chinatown, D.C., there are a number of, of, of urban development plans from the small area development plan, uh, the uh, Urban Land Institute plan and how to use Chinatown Park, Green Street Project from the Association of uh, of American Society of Landscape Architects. It, all these things have elements that are important. And also questions about housing. One of the issues that's facing uh, our neighborhood, Eddie and R, just around the corner, you have, uh, you have a women's shelter and a men's shelter there that has, it is very important and serves an important purpose, but also creates other problems. So the question is, how do you look at this holistically as both a preservation, cultural preservation and issue, but also something that has to do with public safety, has to do with the look at the entire Chinatown. And I would argue, uh, Neil, if you have a chance, come on over to the office and we'll try to sort out things that we're trying to do. One thing that we think we like to do is to develop the block, the Chinatown, uh, the area in front of Eddie's building and between the park, make that into a story center, partially supported by DC Manny's Council, but also mostly supported by private private subscription and uh, other things of this sort. I think we can do that. Uh, that's being discussed now with the ANC. It's also being discussed with the uh, downtown mid, uh, DC Historical Society, and we'll be continuing to do that. So there's a lot of potential. I think there's a, if the pandemic has done one thing, it has forced everybody to think that their previous activities should be reviewed and people should collaborate together and collaboration is just a zoom away, and that's encouraged a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, and so, I'm optimistic. <laughs> I'm optimistic about DC. Ed, Ed, you know, one thing I like to ask about Eddie talking about identity and belonging and changes. I think you made the comment that regardless of the change and the uh, uh, that's happening in DC, Chinatown it will always be Chinatown for you, right? What happens for because you grew up there? What about for your kids? Well, I mean, the, the, I mean, it's always going to be different because my memories are always there. But I mean, I see a totally different Chinatown only because, you know, most of my friends are moved out. Uh, I'm gotten to a point where you know our family has decided to maybe decide to sell it and move on too uh, because it's not you know affordable. Um, I think to sustain that kind of uh, continuation for migrants, you know, immigrants to come in, you would have to have affordable housing. And, you know, unless you have um, constant, you know, either sponsors by, you know, people who, who have money, you know, do they want to stay in Chinatown? You know, do you do they want their kids to grow up in Chinatown? Um, you know, it's, it's it, it can be done, but. I can say it's a matter of affordable housing because you know, when you get a family of, you know, just two, it's different from a family trying to raise a family of three kids and you can't find that kind of space in, you know, DC. You might find a room or, or one bedroom or two, but when you look at that three bedrooms, right, it's almost, you know, you know, obsolete almost, <laughs> you know, which is, which just makes it hard for affordable. I think maybe it comes to a point where you know, to sustain it, you know, the DC government had to say, hey, you know, hey, this area could be, you know, you know, pronounced as affordable housing for a limited amount or, 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 or maybe have donations or foundations where you can have grants, you know, to, so they can fix it up and make it more beautiful and, and, and during, during the gentrification period. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. That's a really important point. And actually, I've been wondering too, as I was watching the film, I think affordable housing is definitely a big element that we're seeing right now with gentrification happening across the country. Right. But also like small moms and pop shops are getting priced out. It's really, really difficult to sustain a business in the downtown area, especially in, in high cost areas like DC, Boston and Chicago. And I'm also wondering too, like for these immigrants that immigrated to 
DC back in the days, would their kids want to work in Chinatown again and take over those small businesses? And that's a really big question that a lot of people are wondering right now. It's like, where where is Chinatown moving to and what will that look like um, in the future? Um, we have a couple more questions coming in and, and there's one that I would like to ask Lisa. Lisa, there's a question about um, whether you found it difficult to find people to talk about their past when you were finding these subjects that were, you were interviewing. What, what was that process like? Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of finding all those people to, to talk about this experience? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I, I'm a firm believer that people want to tell their stories. I mean, you might have to pull it out of them a little bit, but um, people do want to share their stories. So luckily for me and Penny, Penny, Penny's husband is actually from DC's Chinatown. So in terms of accessing stories from you know people in DC's Chinatown, we had that connection through her husband. And then Penny and her husband are also very much involved with the CCBA, the Chinese Consolidated Benevol Benevolent Association, like throughout the country. And so she was able to use those contacts to give us a contact in each city. And then through that contact or two contacts, we were able to then look for people. Um, so it was it was difficult, but I would say as a producer, um, just throughout my career, you know, speaking to people who then can lead you to another person, to another person, eventually you will find people. Um, and I would say in our case, it was it was not that difficult to find people who were going to speak. I mean, sure, some people re were reticent, they always are. Uh, but once we gained their trust and we were like, mm -hmm. we don't want money, any money from you, we're not here to make you look bad. This is not like an expose of any kind. Um, mm -hmm. You know, over time, I mean, as a producer, that's one of your jobs is you're, you know, you're trying to help them. You know, you you want them to trust you, and then once they trust you, they will share with you their stories, and then they're like a faucet. It's hard to turn off. I mean, we have so much, uh, so much in terms of, um, you know, uh, footage that didn't make it into the film just because we tried to keep it to ninety minutes. Um, but yeah, so I mean, we really we're really appreciative to like Spencer Ang, who is in Chicago, um, and also David Wu, who and Jean Lee. They really helped us find people there, um, and then of course, you know, Penny and her husband in D.C. And then in Boston, um, again, we had some contacts on the ground who could who could really help us. And Lisa, sounds like you have plenty of materials to cover for all the future films to come. And, and Margaret has just one last final um, fun question for you. If, um, if there's a film on the New York Chinatowns in the works. You know, we considered New York. We also considered San Francisco. You know, those two Chinatowns, of course, are, you know, the biggest in the country. And um, maybe, you know, I, I would say that, you know, any, it's all on the table right now. Um, you know, we're just trying to get through <laughs> this one. We just finished it in January. And then we'll, you know, we'll talk about what potentially is our next project. But I, I think New York is really interesting. Uh, and maybe we'll, we look at New York and San Francisco, you know, maybe it's like, you know, the different coasts. Um, but we need to see what the story is there. Huge issue in, in New York Chinatown right now where they're dealing yeah. with, you know, the replacement for Rikers. So can you imagine there's a big split, big battle within Chinatown, folks protesting against the reopening of MOCA because MOCA took money, you know, as, as a community benefit for supporting the jail or not supporting, but they won't oppose it anymore, right? So these are the issues that really goes about defining the characteristics, the identity of each and every different Chinatown. Right, and, and to Andrew's point, I mean, we didn't really get into this in the film. We touched on it a little bit, that even within a community, there is there are many voices to contend with. Mm -hmm. So in the film, Andrew touches on Boston's Chinatown and the red light district, also known as the combat zone and how Boston's Chinatown received that, received it. It's because some of the elders at the time, they were like, oh, we'll take it. You know, when the city was like, hey, we're looking for a place to put our red light district, who wants it? And, you know, some of the folks were like, we'll take it because, you know, it could bring in business to our neighborhood. You know, it, it's, but this is like what, back in the 50s or 60s, Andrew, that that no, happened? Uh, uh, 74. 74, yeah. So, but you know, there were people that were upset about that. There were people in Chinatown that were definitely not in favor of that. So, you know, even within a community, you have, di you know, divergent plans and, and hopes.
Yeah. Well, talk about that. I, I, I uh, moved to California in San Francisco, 1977 to 1980, and it was interesting there because uh, uh, the tenderloin over there, back then, is uh, in near Chinatown, and right now, uh, that area is totally taken over by Vietnamese uh, business and shops. Yeah, and I have a lot of friends when I moved out there, and they lived in Chinatown. And I played basketball there in Chinatown also. And then 1980, my dad, you know, when he he was he would passed away, that's why I had to decide whether to stay out there and stay with United Airlines on my job there or move back. So and I decided to move back. You know, it was a big jump, but uh, it worked out, I guess. <laughs> Eddie, and you make such a good point. I um, I actually grew up in San Francisco, and I was gonna say the exact same thing. And um, oh, and Lisa, if you ever need to find film subjects, we have multiple people with various connections. <laughs> I, I totally, Annie. I lived in San Francisco for about eight years, like actually on Stockton, uh, not far from Chinatown. Um, I, I definitely, we we really considered uh, f profiling San Francisco as well, but we we decided to keep it to the yeah. these three. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, yeah. um, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Eddie, Andrew, Ted, and Lisa so much for taking the time to talk to us this afternoon. And a huge thank you to all the audience for staying to the very, very end. Um, yeah. So before we close out, I do want to remind everyone to check out the festival Facebook page for information about our last live Q&A tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, and also um, please come to our closing night in-person screening of The Girl Who Left Home at the AFI Silver next Sunday on July 25th. You can find more information in the link here. And lastly, please vote for Audience Awards. And if you are in the DC, DMV area, um, you know you can definitely find more information on the festival website um, and also on the Facebook page. I want to really thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you for this fantastic conversation. Thanks for an opportunity. Thank you. Good Thanks job, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.